Could you tell us that your, your cinema goes uh, from reality to something in real or um, how is that process of uh, making uh, the story? Um, well, in the case of When Pigs Fly, I mean, When Pigs Fly, I've always loved ghost story movies. I, 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 was, I loved Topper, which was a film from the 30s. And it, well, this was made in 1993, and there was, you know, the AIDS epidemic had killed a lot of our friends. And um, Jim and I lost seven friends in one year. And I felt like these people didn't leave. They stayed with me, and they still talked to me. And, um, and the, when Pigs Fly was basically made from that feeling of, of loss, but the fact that these people still walk with you and they still are with you. And, um, and, and with When Pigs Fly 2, I was very interested in trying to do effects in camera and trying to do magic in, 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 in cinema like a magician would do magic. It, it's different than Sleepwalk. Sleepwalk, it's hard to talk about both films. They're very different processes. I mean, Sleepwalk was, uh, act, that was actually journals. I used to keep journals of uh, weird things I'd see in New York, and then I would slightly you know, exaggerate. And I love those kind of movies. I love movies that are, not, are slightly demented and a step away from reality. And the music plays a role, uh, plays always an important role in, in, uh, in the film. Yeah, in all my films. I, I, I try to use music and sound effects like music. Uh, I, I concentrate a lot on the sound um, in order to, um, you know, a lot of times people don't think about the sound, but I, I've always tried to work with, because I think sound, like if you look at a Hitchcock film and you take sound away from the film, the film is nothing. Sound helps the film, you know, tell a story. It's it's such an essential element. And um, and Strummer, when Strummer did the music, I mean, now he's dead. So it's kind of like it's a little eerie. I think when you see when pigs fly and and you see Strummer, and um, and Strummer had been kept out of the studio uh, after he was in the Clash. The Sony said that he owed them money. That the Clash owed them money, and they kept him out of the studio. So when I went to Wales, then Jim and I went to Wales, and he, uh, he gave me nine hours of music in three days, because he just like exploded. And, and I was like, hey, Joe, I can't even index this music. I, I don't have enough money. <laughs> but he was very generous. But you, yeah, you invited the night of uh, pop music, Marianne Faithful. Yeah, well, and Marianne, you know, she had her own close calls to death. So she had she had an understanding about being a ghost, mm -hmm. and um, and Marianne was great to work with. She was really a pro, and she was really good with that little girl, really really helpful, and um, and uh, I always wanted Joe and Marianne to do a duet duet together, but they never did. I thought their voices would sound amazing. Yeah, I thought I was going to be able to shoot in Falls River, Massachusetts, which is where I thought I was going to shoot, and um, and then I got I didn't couldn't get funding in the United States, and I got funding. I was offered money from the Hamburg Film Fund, and so uh, I just I decided to you know that's where I got the money to shoot the film, and. <laughs> so, in a harbor, yeah. And False River was all, is also, you know, it's like a river town and stuff. So, um, and it was also very soon after the wall, because the wall came down in 89. So this was, nine, we shot in 92. And, um, and I insisted on shooting in Wiesmar, which was a former East Germany. And my West German crew was ob objected to it. They said, oh, the East Germans are really slovenly. Like they had a prejudice against the East Germans. And then when we started shooting there, it was great. And it was the same town that Nosferatu was shot in, which I didn't know until I got there. And, and you'd see these Russian soldiers that were walking around. They would march around these kind of ragged uniforms because they couldn't afford to send them back to Russia. And so I used them as ghosts in the street walk. And we fed them and paid them very well. And, um, um, and, and Bismarck was like a haunted town. I mean, it was, uh, 
Um, and, and then we got hit by the neo-Nazis. They came and they destroyed my, the one American car that I, I found and um, put sugar in the gas tanks and they drew swastikas on that, um, on that brick building because they were very fearful of anybody who was an outsider coming in. And, um, and it was a very bizarre experience. It was great. I mean, the German crew and working with Robbie Mueller and, you know, I had a great, I mean, I had a lot of support, and I was very grateful for that. So, so that's why I ended up in Germany. Sure, why not? Sure. <laughs> You're awake. <laughs> I had wanted to do a film called Two Serious Ladies. It was based on a Jane Bowles novel. And I had seen him in Joe Orton, which was, and he was very fat in that movie. And I wanted, and the character in the Two Serious Ladies, he got to be very fat. And I, I met with Alfred, and he, he was very thin at that point. And he said, I can't wait to get fat again. <laughs> and then, and we had this wonderful meeting in, in London about this other film. And then, and then actually when I met him, and I met Marianne around the same time, that's when uh, Ray Dobbins and I started talking about this story and working on this script and writing it for him as a skinny person. <laughs> and, and I had him read a book about the jazz musician Art Pepper. And he did a lot of research on jazz musicians and things like that. Alfred's a wonderful actor to work with. He's, he's so inventive and he just loves to act. And he, I remember he really annoyed the wardrobe people because he kept hanging up his costumes. And they were like, will he just leave his costumes? And he's from the theater, so he was supposed to <laughs> take care of his own wardrobe. So uh, when it was released, uh, how was the reception and uh, the, the critical and public reception? For When Pigs Fly? Yeah. Um, when Pigs Fly had a kind of gangster producer, and um, which is why also I ended up in Germany. Um, and um, um, he went bankrupt and 11 films went down with him. And, um, and I had kind of, I had a feeling, they wanted me to do post-production in Germany, but I had a feeling something was going awry. And I moved everything to New York, and I also moved everything out of the lab in Hamburg, and I moved it to a lab in Berlin. And he was supposed to tell the bank that put up the money that I had moved the negative. So when, but he didn't tell them, this producer never told them. So when he went bankrupt, which was before I finished the film, um, cause he had 11 films that went down with him. He, he, uh, the bank called me and they said, we own your negative in Hamburg. And I said, well, there is no negative in Hamburg. And so they couldn't get the negative and it was really amazing. It took 14 years to get this film back. And so it was released in Japan because there was Japanese money involved and it did very well in Japan. Um, there's been now retrospects of my work in the States and in Toronto and things like that. So people have gotten a chance to see it now. But it took um, my American producer and I 14 years to get the, the rights back and to be able to, to show it. So, and it was, it, was, it was shown at the Toronto Film Festival. It got a really, it got a very, some very nice reviews and stuff. And then, and then the bankruptcy stuff was going on. So it was like a nightmare. The fun of making films. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it looks like your films usually resurrect. It happened, uh, that, that incredible story with your Nabai. I know. And then this one <laughs> resurrected 14 years later. It's true, it's true. Yeah. Why do they have to go away yeah. though? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they come like, not ghosts, but well, there's always. Yeah, because he's talking about that I, I had made this film that's showing yeah. tomorrow. tomorrow. And uh, it was based on Paul Ball's story. And, uh, and the negative and everything were destroyed in a storage facility. and. We were heartbroken that it was had just disappeared, and the only print I had was a 16 millimeter print that had played all these festivals and was basically unprojectable. And then I got a call in 2010 
from these archivists who were working with Paul Bowles, and they found a print I had sent Paul in 1981 of the film, because then there was no VHS, there was no, the only way I could have the writer, Paul Bowles, see the film was to send him a print. And it was among his things, and which I was really honored. There was a really wonderful picture that the archivist sent me with Jane, Jane Bowles' typewriter, Paul Bowles' typewriter, and my film. And then it was covered with bug, like all kinds of, um, like bug sprays and powders. And we think, because 16 millimeter black and white is very delicate, and in that climate of Tangier, it's remarkable that the print stayed in pristine condition. And we were able to generate a new negative. The original that they found at Paul Bowles is now in an archive with Paul Bowles' other materials. And then they showed it at the Masterworks at New York Film Festival in 2011. So that was a strange journey, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see, tomorrow you can see at Teatro Nacional de Maria in the evening, you can see this film, You Are Not I. And uh, film um, Sarah is working on these days, so you she's going to um, to make you see um, about 20 minutes, is it? Yes, 20 minutes. Uh, a film, uh, a documentary on Basquiat. So we hope you can come tomorrow and see you tomorrow at the end Dona Maria to see that. And Sarah will uh, talk about it mainly, be, it won't be so late. Ma mainly, it, no, tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow it won't be so late <laughs> because it's uh, the only the two films. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.